Hi everyone, Rob Ryder, uh, June 19th, 2013. Um, this is out of a book called The Expulsion of the Jews from England in 1290. And it was written in well, the Jewish Quarterly Review. And eventually we're going to talk about the Constitution of the Jewry. But before we can go there, we need to want to fill in some other blanks first. Uh, so indulge me while I start with a few of the secret sayings of the living Jesus spoke by Didymus Judas Thomas recorded the Apostle Thomas and he said whoever discovers the interpretation of these sayings will not taste death of course that's what Jesus is saying and Jesus also said those who seek should not stop seeking until they find when they find they will be disturbed when they are disturbed they will marvel and will rule over the all what that means to me is as you go on this journey looking at things you're gonna find things that say, no that can't be right? oh my gosh no 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 but you know when you get beyond that you may marvel and you will rule over the all and then Jesus said if your leaders say to you look the father's imperial rule is in the sky then the birds of the sky will precede you if they say to you, it is in the sea, then the fish of the sea will precede you. Rather, the Father's imperial rule is inside you and outside you. When you know yourselves, then you will be known, and you will understand that you are the children of the living Father. But if you do not know yourselves, then you will live in pov poverty, and you are the poverty. I think that applies to today, just uh, screams out at me that that this is what applies today. We need to know ourselves. You will be known. You will understand that you are the children of the living Father. In other words, that you are God. So, you know, act like one. Or act like the one. Now, I had done a video earlier where I said, hey, I think we need to do something with our baptismal records. And, you know, that was uh, over the weekend and found a few more things. And this came off the Archdiocese of St. Louis. Uh, Mike from Utah sent this to me. Sacramental records are mixed nature, private and public. They are private in that they are intended to document an individual status within the church. Well, what status would that be? Well, if you're baptized, that you're baptized in the church. If you're confirmation, you're confirmed into the church. You know, those are sacramental records intended to document your status, that you are a Christian. Sacramental records are public and that they will stand in civil law as valid and authentic evidence when an appropriate civil record does not exist. Well, why would they even mention this on a archdiocese website talking about these records standing as authentic evidence in civil law, so in a court of law they stand as authentic evidence. Evidence of what? Evidence that you're a Christian if the appropriate civil record does not exist. So it just depends. Does the civil law know that you're a Christian? And this goes to the thing in the Episcopal Church where it says to be a communicant in good standing regardless of the Christian church that you were baptized in. If you were baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit then uh, they want to have you register with their church. Not be baptized by them. Register with them. If you're not sure if you were baptized before, hey, they got a little process to get around that. They'll baptize you. And then they and then maybe that puts you in the civil record because this Episcopal Church is tied directly to the Church of England, which was the Court of Chancery, which is, you know, one of the superior courts of England, one of the courts of justice. It's important to understand that although these records are public, they in that they stand in civil law. So again, it's important to know that they stand in civil law as your status as a Christian if you tell them. They are not public in the sense that they are open to immediate examination and inspection by anyone for whatever reason. In other words, they're not going to go look for it. You need to tell them. You need to provide the evidence or have the civil record created to show that you are a Christian. For example, civil records of birth and our public records restricted from use for long periods of time. See, birth are for civil records of birth, right? 
those exist are public records restricted for use for long periods of time. It is the same with sacramental records of the church. Restrictions on access may therefore be legitimately opposed without violating the essential private and public nature of the records. Well, what is the thing about your civil public records, right? Um, first of all, you get a copy and somebody else is holding the original. And, um, hang on just a second. Sorry about that. Um, and you can only get your birth records. You can only get your birth records. Nobody else can get your birth records. You get them. So it would be the same with these sacramental records. It sounds like that you would need to get them. And so, you know, it talks about how you do that. Well, you know, why is all this important? Well, I'm just trying to fill in some blanks. It'll all come together here in a bit. This is the definition of sign in Bouvier's. Contracts and evidence. A token of anything, a note, or token given without words. Right? Um, among all nations find at all times certain signs have been considered as proof of assent or dissent. For example, the nodding of a head, the shaking of hands. In certain nations at certain times, certain signs mean certain things. Doesn't matter if you don't know them. In their system, it still is what is. And I still remember when I met the, these treasury agents here going three years ago and I walked in and John wanted to shake my hand and I said uh, to the effect that uh, for the record some consider shaking hands to be a sign of consenting to jurisdiction but that is not so in this case. And John didn't let go of my hand he thought about it for just a second he said but cannot two men ex exchange pleasantries and I said well yes John or yes they can I didn't know I didn't know his name was John then yes they can but two persons can't and we had a great conversation. Anyways, um, the learned author of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire in his 44th chapter remarks, Among savage nations, now what would savage nations be if we're talking the Roman Empire in the uh, 5th or 6th century or whenever it actually fell? 6th century, I guess it would be. Well, and now it was the Christian Roman Empire. right? So when they're talking about savage nations, they're talking about non-Christian nations. The want of letters is imperfectly supplied by the use of visible signs, which awaken attention and perpetuate the remember, remember, remembrance of any public or private transaction. Visible signs. The jurisprudence of first Romans exhibited the scenes of pantomime. The words were adapted to the gesture, and the slightest error or neglect in the forms of proceeding was sufficient to annul the substance of the fairest claim. Now this is the first Romans, right? This isn't the Christian Romans, this is the pagan Romans. Words were adapted to gestures, and the slightest error and neglect in forms of proceeding was sufficient to annul the substance of the fairest claim. Didn't matter if you were correct, it's not that you're not correct, I'm just not inclined to issue any warrants. I had a magistrate tell me that. Uh, the clenched fist was a symbol of a pledge or deposit. The right hand was a gift of faith and confidence. Right? It's a gift when you give them your hand. Of faith in them and confidence, even though they may screw you. <clears throat> and the hare who accepts a testament was sometimes obligated, obliged, to snap his fingers and to cast away his garments and to leap and dance with real or affected transport. And I meant to find that saying in the Gospel of Thomas, because that's one of the things that Jesus says you'll do. Basically, you take off your garments and put them on the ground and stomp on them like a little kid and run for glee. Uh, in a civil action, the plaintiff touched his ear of the witness, seized his reluctant adversary by the neck, and implored in solemn lamentations the aid of his fellow citizens. These were all signs that, that could be done. This occult science of words and actions of law was an inheritance of pontiffs and patriarchs. So this is what they inherited from the Roman system when Rome became Christian. This is what we had to deal with. They got this occult science that runs their laws. They want, now the whole empire is Christian. How can we change this system to make it a Christian-based 
law system instead of an occult based law system. Like the Shalderan astrologers, they announced to their clients the day's business and response. The import trifles were interwoven with religious or pneuma. This is what they inherited. And after publication of the Twelve Tables, the Roman people were still enslaved by ignorance of judicial proceedings. The treachery of some plebeian officers at length revealed the profitable mystery. In a more enlightened age, the legal actions were derided and observed, and the same antiquity which sanctified the practice obliterated the use of and meaning of the, this primitive language. Well, all that means to me is, okay, we, the system has been around, for a long time, so it's, you know, it's common law. It's what it is. It, you can use these signs in a court. Well, what sign would a Christian use to show that he is a Christian? The sign of the cross. And so, you would bless yourself in court in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Amen. Making the sign of the cross. There will be no question now that you're a Christian. And are they going to persecute a Christian? Well, let's find out. I found this on Rents. Talmud encourages Jews to deceive. And uh, this guy Ted Pike has a video out on YouTube called The Other Israel, where he goes into a lot of this. But he had done this writing also, so I just wanted to pull some things off of it. And so this is what the Talmud says about Jews and Gentiles, because to a Jew, a Gentile is anybody who's not a Jew. Well, as far as that goes, to a Christian, anybody who's not a Christian is a Gentile, right? It's a pagan. The rabbis believed Gentiles demonstrated their stupidity by thinking their own laws were worthy of obeying. The Talmud denies the Gentile status of man, so as so they are also excluded from being Jews' neighbors. Well, isn't that interesting? Thinking their own law or worthy of a bane. So if you were in a Jewish court, it wouldn't matter if you brought up a statute or a code or a former court case or any of that kind of stuff. None of that matters in, in the court of a Jew, right? It's not worthy of being obeyed. And in there, in the Talmud denies a Gentile the status as a man, right? And that's why they want you to be a person. God outlawed the Gentiles. The Talmud position concerning deception of Gentiles is embodied in the Halakhic dictum. It is permitted to deceive the Gentile in legal and business matters. And the Talmud says Gentiles are beneath equality with Jews. As a 1905 Jewish encyclopedia explains, the Gentiles were outlawed by God, by God from the beginning. And Mr. is... Another way of saying gentleman, and gentleman comes from genteel, and genteel is gentile, and gentile means you are a pagan. Did a video on it. Don't let them call you mister. In a Jewish courtroom. Jewish contempt of Gentile law was best illustrated in a courtroom. Imagine, imagine a Jewish court in Babylon in 350 AD as the Jewish Encyclopedia describes. It sometimes happens that the Gentile, wishing to take advantage of the liberal Jewish laws, summoned his Jewish opponent to a Jewish court. In such cases, the Gentile would gain little benefit, as he would be dealt with by the Jewish or Gentile laws as they best advant at the least advantageous to him. The judge would say, this is in accordance to our law, or with your law, as the case may be. If this was not satisfactory to the Gentile, legal quibbles and circumventions might be employed against him. Legal quibbles, legalism, Protestant legalism. There you go. The primary source of the above quote, eh, the guy elaborates, when a suit arises between an Israelite and a heathen, if you can satisfy the former according to the laws of Israel, justify him and say, this is our law. So as also you can justify him by the laws of the heathen justify him and say to the other party this is your law but if this cannot be done we use subterfuges to circumvent them this is the view of a couple of rabbis said that we could not attempt to circumvent them on account of sanctification of the name however the same source comments but there is no infringement 
of sanctification in name, we could circumvent it. So you have one name that's sanctified, and that sanctified name is going to be on your baptismal certificate. And once it's been sanctified and noticed, then they can't do this against the name anymore. Another reason for discrimination was the vile and vicious character of the Gentiles, which such character, it would naturally be quite unsafe to trust a Gentile as a witness he could not be he could not depend upon to keep his promise or word of honor like a Jew right and they're asking you did you sign this paper right isn't that your promise they want you to think that that deed of trust is a unilateral contract and you're just gifting them the property and you made a promise because you signed the paper but it's actually a bilateral contract that the other party hasn't signed. But that isn't how they're trying to use it. They're simulating the legal process. That would, you know, to me, that's what uh, this uh, subterfuge is that we're talking about here. Legal quibbles and circumventions. By sanctification, the name uh, refers to the dignity and reputation of God's name in the eyes of the world. If lying in a court may bring disrespect to Israel and thus to God of the Hebrews' will, then it better not be done. The real question about preventing justice against a Gentile is whether a Jew can get away with it. The Jewish Encyclopedia summarizes the majority opinion, stating, The Mish Mishnah declares that if a Gentile sue an Israelite, the verdict is for the defendant, for the Israelite. If an Israelite is the plaintiff, he obtains full damages then get you to be a Gentile, you ain't going to win. And so that's what they're asking you first. What is your name? Or do they want to call you Mr. Ritluski? The divine right of cheating. Outright robbery of a Gentile is not endorsed, but the Tal Talibun makes bra broad provisions for indirect thievery. If a Jew, a Jew doesn't need to return a lost article to the Gentile. Where is all that lost mail we're not getting for the true name, Ritluski, comma, Robert Allen? Where's his mail? It's lost. They're not returning it. And, you know, if somebody steals your stuff, it doesn't come back to you. I mean, I don't know how it all works in court, right? It just seems like that's something that seems to be happening. And with all those lost things of thy brothers, it is to your brother that you make restoration. But you need not make restoration to the heathen. And as Rabbi warned, a Jew must avoid bringing God's name into dishonor by cheating Gentiles. Yet as the passage reveals, Rabbi was not above cheating a Gentile out of a full price of a gold bowl, while another Rabbi cheated a Gentile of both number and price of quantity of barrels. It's okay to cheat. Now, from the thing we're going to look at here in a bit, the expulsion of the Jews from England. It's just a little excerpt. Under the firm reign, firm reign of Henry II, anti-Jewish feelings found no further expression in act. In other words, nothing else was done. The king, like his predecessors, gave and secured to the Jews special privileges so great as to arouse the envy of their neighbors, the Christians. They were allowed to settle their own disputes in their own Beth Din or ecclesiastical court and in so far to enjoy a privilege that was granted only under the strictest limitations to the Christian church. So King Henry II gave a whole bunch of things to the Jews. Now we're talking 12th century stuff here and between you know about the time the Normans came the Jews showed up and they did, and that what they brought with them, their only trade they had, the only skill they had, is usury. That was the skill they had, and that's what they used, and they got everybody in debt by usury, because they don't mind cheating a Gentile, and if you're a Christian to a Jew, you're a Gentile. However, if you bring up the name of God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen, Bless yourself in the sign of the cross and tell them I am a Christian and are you going to be my false accuser? Oh, I always like this one. This is out of Vienna, some conference they had, where it was said, Whoever shall hereafter dare assert, maintain, or pretentiously hold that the rational or intellectual soul is not per se and essentially 
the form of a human body is to be regarded as a heretic. Right? You tell them, hey, I'm a rational or intellectual soul, essentially in the form of a human body, and for them not to agree with you makes them a heretic. I am an immortal living soul, creating the image of God. Here is one of his people. If they deny that, that just made them a heretic. That's good to know, because if they were baptized, and they do that, that's what makes them a heretic. So what is the history of the Episcopal Church? In the beginning, the Church of England from the Episcopal Church derives date to at least the second century. That's how early Christians were in England. Uh, but it's customary to regard St. Augustine of Canterbury's mission in 597 as making the formal beginnings of the Church under papal authority as it was to be throughout the Middle Ages. Modern form, the Church dates the English Reformation in the 16th century where royal supremacy was established and the authority of the papal seat was repudiated. So within the realms of England, the Pope has no jurisdiction. And we are in the realm of England. Quit blaming the Pope. He ain't doing it to you. With the advent of British colonization, the Church of England was established on every continent. They held the first mass, uh, or whatever, you, whatever they call it there. I don't know if they call it a mass or not. Um, 1575 or something like that in California. Right, That's how long the Anglican Church has been on the continent. In 1786, English churchmen had helped change the law so the Church of England could offer Episcopal consecration to those churches outside of England. They'd be talking about the United States of America because it's just after the Revolutionary War. And this is interesting. In 1787, Archbishop of Canterbury um, consecrated some bishops. Soon after, James Madison was consecrated in England as a bishop of Virginia and president of the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg. I thought James Madison was in the government, and yet he's a consecrated bishop, and he's sitting over a college. Interesting. I don't think there's any separation of church and state. Ah, uh, the Assembly of the American Church, the Assembly of the American Church, the American Church met in Philadelphia in 1789 to unify all Episcopalians in the United States into a single national church. We do have a church. The first American Book of Common Prayer. There ain't no separation of church and state. Oh, in the diocese we got missionary districts within the United States. And there's 109 provinces. Okay. And so um, a story I had told numerous times about a conversation I had that I had done an audio on with a guy who stopped in Santa Fe, New Mexico, was there on vacation, went into the county, was talking to the court clerk, the circuit court clerk, the trial level court clerk, and he accepted her oath and bound her to it and said, uh, I believe that your oath is held by the bishop. And the lady hesitated for a second or so and said, yes it is. Now, at the time, we were thinking it was the Catholic bishop. And in Santa Fe is the Archdiocese of Santa Fe, or whatever that area is, of the Catholic Church. That Archdiocese actually covers all of Arizona. But when he was talking to her, she had said, because now he, cause he is sitting in Santa Fe having this conversation, she says, well, you may get your questions better answered in the next city over. In other words, not in Santa Fe. And, you know... Not knowing at the time what that meant, learning later that Santa Fe has an archdiocese and thinking it was the Catholic Church that was into all this and having had many people send things to different bishops, putting in complaints and so forth, and, and really not getting anywhere, being told, in my own case, that um, uh, we have no jurisdiction in civil matters, to uh, um, telling a brother, you know, face to face, that um, when he was bringing up all these complaints, he says, yeah, they don't listen to us anymore, whoever they are. You know, he was talking to a Catholic bishop. People have talked to vicar generals, they, they, all sorts of things. The point is, she said the next city over. The next city over is Albuquerque, New Mexico, or it is a next city over. It's just down the expressway. And guess what they have there? They have a diocese of the Episcopal Church. And if we're under the laws of England, 
then the Episcopal Church is the national church and it represents the Court of Chancery. And that's because the Court of Chancery is one of the four superior courts of England. It is a court of justice. It is part of the civil authority. But it was always um, governed by an ecclesiastic. So here's a little bit more. See, okay, it's in fellowship with the one holy Catholic and apostolic church in communion with the See of Canterbury. Government of this church and its overseas missionaries and jurisdictions. That was in 1789. And here's some things it says. So this is their constitution of the um, Episcopal Church of the United States of America. Baptism is not only a sign or profession, and a mark of difference whereby Christian men are discerned from others that be not Christian, but it is also a sign of regeneration or new birth whereby an instrument, they that receive baptism rightly, are grafted into the church. The promise of forgiveness of sin and of our obligation to be the sons of God by the Holy Spirit are visible, signed, and sealed. Faith is confirmed. Grace is increased by virtue of prayer unto God. They're talking about your baptismal certificate. And on the Catholic website for St. Louis there, it said that it's recognized by civil law, even if the civil record doesn't exist. And we're just trying to get it in there. And this is the church. It says to be a communicant in good standing, you need to have recorded or registered your baptismal certificate with the church. Baptism of young children uh, is in any way is to be retained in the church. The power of the civil magistrate. The power of the civil magistrate extended to all men, as well as clergy, as laity, and all things temporal, but hath no authority in things purely spiritual. And we hold it to be the duty of all men who are professors of the gospel to pay respectful obedience to the civil authority regularly and legitimately constituted. of Christian men's goods which are not in common. The riches and goods of Christian men are not common as touching to the right title and possession of the same. So tell them you're a Christian man and you have the right title and interest. And now I want my possession. But certain Anabaptists falsely boast otherwise, that it is communal. That would be like communism. One of those isms. Notwithstanding, every man ought to, of such thing he has possesseth, make a liberal give of alms to the poor according to his ability of the Christian man's oath uh, basically but that a man may swear an oath when a magistrate requireth it in cause of faith and charity and this is uh, parts of the constitution that had to do with the creation of the church what was 1571 originally um, where it says uh, that is, that they should rule the estates and degrees committed to their charge by God. The estates. And then the rector here where I'm at, when you look at his biography um, for a local Episcopal church, he is a professional trustee and conservator at the, at the Kent County um, Probate Court and the Civil Service Division and, and over hospices right he's the one managing the estates the Bishop of Rome hath no jurisdiction in this realm of England the only question is are we still under the laws of England because the laws of the realm may punish Christian men with death for heinous and grievous offenses it is un it is lawful for Christian men at the commandment of the magistrate to wear weapons and serve in the wars Now, this is about the Chancellor being formerly, usually an ecclesiastic, and presiding over the royal chapel, he became the keeper of the king's peace, or the king's conscience. Because the bishop diocese, this is the bishop of London, includes the royal palaces and the seat of government at Westminster, he is regarded as the king's bishop. That's of today. This part here, this first part's out of, uh, that's out of Blackstone. And uh, this is out of uh, just telling what the talking about the Bishop of London on uh, Wikipedia. 
The Bishop of London is or is the ordinary of the Church of England Diocese of London in the province of Canterbury. The diocese covers uh, 177 square miles of Greater London, north of the River Thames, historically the county of Mid Middlesex, and a small part of the county of Surrey. And in Blackstone's commentaries, he talks about these writs of Middlesex, or something like that, and it was a way to get around the common law. to bring a charge against you to take your property. The sea is the city of London, where the seat is located at Cathedral Church of St. Paul, which was founded as Cathedral in 604, rebuilt in 1675, following the Great London Fire of 1666. And another part of Blackstone, before I descend to consider particular ecclesiastical courts, I remember that's the court of the Jew, ecclesiastical courts. I must first of all, in general, premise that in the time of our Saxon ancestors there was no sort of distinction between lay and ecclesiastic jurisdiction. The county court was as much a spiritual as a temporal tribunal. The rights of the church were asserted and asserted at the time by the same judge as the rights of the laity. For this purpose, the bishop of the diocese and the alderman, or in his absence, the sheriff of the county, used to sit together in the county court and heard all the cognizance of all causes as well, ecclesiastical as civil. So, to me, to hear all causes of the court of the Jew and the civil law, civil authority of England. Now, court civil and ecclesiastic. The rule is well settled that the civil courts will not enforce judgments of ecclesiastical courts of the court of the Jew. But when the parties by valid agreement constitute an ecclesiastic court the arbitrator between them, so you agree to have the court of the Jew be your arbitrator, and then agree to abide by its decision as an award, the civil courts will enforce the award. So, I think they're taking you to the court of the Jew as a Gentile because you haven't told him you're a Christian. You haven't made an outward sign of your faith, the sign of the cross, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. They're going to treat you like a Jew, even though in that court there is somebody there who's representing the bishop, waiting to see if you're going to show, did you come here as a Christian or did you come here as a Jew? or as a Gentile. Are you Mr. Rutluski? Right? Self-confession. Is this your name on the paper? No, it's not your name, but if you say it is, right? You say you're the defendant, well, you're a liar. Because <coughs> <coughs> that name doesn't exist. It's a <coughs> name of a John Doe. they were allowed to settle so again uh, this is what we're going to be reading next from the the expulsion of the Jews <coughs> from England they were allowed to settle their own disputes in their own Beth Din or ecclesiastic court <coughs> the king like his predecessors gave and secured to the Jews special privileges so great as to rouse the envy of their neighbors who would their neighbors be <laughs> their neighbors would be the Christians of England, who had been there since the second century. So, <laughs> again, this is the expulsion of the Jews from England, 1290. If you go to archive.org and just put on the expulsion of the Jews from England or the expulsion of the Jews, whatever part you want to put in, you'll find where you can download this. Anyways, so they gave them special privileges. They gave them their own constitution. What's this constitution say? Richard's policy, or of his conciliars, was simple. On the one hand, in order to encourage rich Jews to continue to make England their home, he issued a charter of protection in which he guaranteed to certain Jews, and perhaps all those who were wealthy, the privileges that had enjoyed that they had enjoyed under his father and great grandfather. 
they were to hold land as they had hereto done, their heirs were to succeed to their money debts, they were to be allowed to go where they pleased throughout the country, and to be free of all tolls and dues. On the other hand, he asserted and enforced his rights over them and their property by organizing a complete supervision of all their business transactions. 1194, so this is happening before 1194. In 1194, he issued a code of regulations in which he ordered that the registers of all that belonged to them should be kept for the information of the treasury. And what do we have in the treasury? They have our information listed in there. All their deeds were to be executed in one of the six or seven places where they were established Months of Jewish and Christian clerks, especially appointed to witness them. <laughs> All right, so there's places where there's Jewish and Christian clerks together who are appointed to witness documents. They were to be entered on an official list, and a half of each was to be deposited in a public chest under the control of the royal officers. All right, so they were to be entered on an official list. These are the deeds, and half of each was to be deposited in a public chest under the control of royal officers, officers of the king. And they don't want us to see our Christian side. They say that these people in the county have told Roe they're doing these things for her protection. When she's trying to get information, they won't give it to, to her, right? Well, what kind of protection are they talking about? No Jew was to plead before anyone but the king's officers, and special justices were appointed to hear. Their case is an exercise of general control of their business. Their constitution underwent various modifications under Richard's successors. The privileges which had first been granted to certain Jews by name were now extended by John to the whole community and the royal hold over them was tightened by an edict issued in 1219. Well, what did John, who was a king of England, do before 1219? Well, in 1215, he signed the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta is the constitution of the Jew. That's what we're talking about. The constitution of the Jews is the Magna Carta. This elaborate constitution did not intend to afford complete security against the repetition of the massacres of 1189 and 1190, but its existence was a more solemn and official recognition that had been given before of the fact that the king had, was the sole lord and protector, the king has to protect you, of the Jew, and that he would regard an injury done to them as an injury to himself. And thus it went far to secure to him his revenue and to them their safety. Now I say Jew, let's just say Gentile, right? As far as the king's concerned, because he's a Christian, if you're not a Christian, you're a Gentile. We had a certain group of Gentiles called Jews, and we're going to write them a constitution called a Magna Carta, because we like their money. They became a slave to money, right? They started selling themselves for gold. And thus it went far to secure to him his revenue and to them their safety. From this time forward, the Jews yielded to the king not simply a regular contribution, such as 60,000 pounds, they had paid Henry II, and the sums that they had paid Longchamp towards the expense of Richard's crusade, but a steady and regular income. They paid tallages, heavy reliefs on succeeding to property, and besent to the pound of 10%. On their loan transactions, they were liable to test cheats, confiscations of land, debts, fines, and merriments of all kinds. Their average annual contribution to the tre treasury during the latter part of the 12th century was probably about 12th of the whole royal revenue, and of a greater part of what they owed, the realization was nearly certain. So the Jews paid their debts. The king likes their money. So he's going to keep you from being seen until you come forward and say that you're a Christian. That treats you like a Jew. We'll just take your money. 
take your property, whatever we want to do. Other debtors may find a delay of resistance or legal formalities a way of avoiding payment, but the Jews were in the king's hands. He could order the sheriffs of the county to distrain on defaulters, and there was no one between the sheriff and the Jews. He could despoil them of their lands and debts. He could imprison them in royal castles. In the reign of John, and all the Jews and Jewesses of England were thrown into prison by his command, and are said to have been reduced to such poverty that they begged for, from door to door and prowled about the city like dogs. we got a whole bunch of people living like this right now because they're being treated like Jews. When they are Christians, they just have and profess their faith and show a sign of the cross. Whatever it takes, take them a copy of your baptismal certificate. So, uh, the only way they had of removing any of their property from his reach was by burying it, whereupon the king, if he had any suspicion that Jew had more treasure than was apparent, might order him to have a tooth drawn every day until he paid enough to purchase a pardon. And we got our own versions of that going on right now. So, you know, hey, this is the history, man. This great thing called the Magna Carta was, uh, what did they call it? What, what did the Jewish Quarterly Review call it? The Constitution of the Jewry. 1215, Magna Carta. You might want to think about it. You might want to understand that when you go into a uh, um, when you go into a Jewish courtroom, that uh, is permitted to deceive, deceive a Gentile in legal and business matters, and that the rabbis believe Gentiles distribute their distribute demonstrated their stupidity by thinking their own laws were worthy of obeying. Ha! Huh, we're not going to obey those laws. They're not the laws of God. They're the laws of a Gentile. Don't apply to me. Okay, well, I got the laws of a Christian. Your laws don't apply to me. It's good for one, it's good for another. And there's an occult science that has come down from millennium and it was inherited by the Christians who did as much as they could to mold it into something that wouldn't that would not be a detriment to the Christians but because it, you know it's it's a custom they don't have any control over the custom so I think what they did to, to same antiquity when sanctified the practice obliterated the use of, and meaning of the primitive language so let's sanctify it in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Amen. Beautiful. Give them an outward sign that you're a Christian. And then see if the false accuser continues. Because you brought the name of God into the courtroom where they want to tell you that God doesn't exist. Yet Jesus himself said, if they're telling you it's in the sky or they're telling you it's in the sea, don't believe them wherever you are. That's where God exists. However, the same there uh, there shall there were but were there no infringement on sanctification of the name, we could circumvent him. So sanctify the name in the name of God. Because if lying in the court may bring disrespect to Israel and thus to God of have, of the Hebrews will, then it had better not be done. Sanctification of the name refers to the dignity and reputation of God's name in the eyes of the world. And Adam named God, Amen. Okay, that's enough on this. I gotta make a few phone calls and find out where my baptismal certificate is. More on that later. See ya.